Hi, everyone, and welcome. Let folks join and get on. Give about a minute for everyone to join. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. Great, and as you're arriving, please jump onto the chat and share who you are, where you're coming from, your organization, your location. It's fun to be able to meet each other. And as you're doing that, please share to panelists and attendees. So let everyone else see who, um, who you are. Great, well, I'll go ahead and get started. We've got a wonderful agenda for you today. So we've got lots to share. Welcome to the third installment or the fourth installment and final installment of our 2021 SGSO Network Leadership Institute Promising Practices webinar series. So today we are diving into everything about measuring impacts and sharing results in garden-based education. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the recording will be shared in a follow-up email on our, and on our website. All recordings are always included in the archive section of our website. The link is right here um, on, the, uh, on the slide. A copy of the presentation will be shared in the, in the chat, a PDF of the, a link to the PDF of the presentation will be shared in the chat and will also be archived on our website alongside of the recording. Um, we are asking you all to ask questions via our chat section this time. Um, the webinar is an hour and 15 minutes long, and we will have different sections along the way for you to allow um, for, for you to ask questions about that section. So go ahead and throw your questions up into the chat. And um, if you have an answer to someone's question, please go ahead and allow for peer-to-peer -peer answering of questions um, in this webinar. And then finally, we'd love to know what you thought. Um, so please fill out our survey at the end. There will be a link and it'll pop up on your screen. You'll also get a link in your follow-up email. So just a little bit about the SGSO network and overview for those of you who might be new to joining us. We are the School Garden Support Organization Network, SGSO for short. And our goal is all about connecting school garden support organizations, school garden support professionals to help and inspire to share best practices, resources, and ideas, all for supporting the school garden movement. We do, we have peer-to-peer -peer opportunities in three main ways, through our webinars, our in-person gatherings, and our digital comments. If you'd like to join either our email list or our very active and awesome Google forum, you can go to SGSO network forward slash connect. And then brand new, you can also follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Brand new pages, still developing content, um, but we're really excited about it at SGSO Network. We really see ourselves as a place to be a platform for the National School Garden Movement. So go ahead and follow us and feel free to tag us and we'd love to be a place for you to share anything in relation to school gardens. Oops. <clears throat> One second, let me go back to presenting. Awesome. And then we also want to make sure that you know about the Growing School Gardens virtual school garden tour event. The SGSO Network is supporting the Sprouts Healthy Community Foundations and this amazing kind of uh, virtual school assembly, if you will, by kids for kids. It'll be a virtual school garden tour going from seven stops from Hawaii to DC on Tuesday, April 27th and 10 a.m. Um, like I said, there will be stops at seven different school gardens and each stop will have an accompanying lesson and activity for students to join in, whether they're at home or in, in the classroom. We really see it as an amazing kind of celebration of school gardens that you all are invited to. And we'd love for you all to invite your networks to. Um, so we have a promotional toolkit for you to, to utilize, to share a number of different resources to help you get the word out. And if you'd like, um, if you're an SGSO and you'd like a dual branded one pager, just email me, Tristana at sgsonetwork.org. And I'm happy to create a dual branded one pager for you, but check out our promotional toolkit. 
We also have a number of ways for you to engage with the community throughout the month of April, uh, just to continue to celebrate school gardens. So we've got a hashtag contest, growing school gardens, a chance to win a hundred dollar gift card to Gardener Supply. These are the different um, ways to, or how to enter. So please follow those directions and follow us on social media to get all those details. And then we're also partnering with Kids Gardening to um, amplify Kids Garden Month throughout the month of April. So head over there and share, follow the directions for how to share what do you love about your garden for chances to win throughout April, both weekly prizes as well as um, win one of six $500 grand prize grant from Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation. So on to today's webinar. We've got a number of folks joining us today from the US, Germany, Canada, Dubai, and Brazil. Y'all come from a number of different organizations and entities, but the majority of you are from nonprofits and you support over 7,400 school gardens. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to John Fisher of Life Lab, our partner in the Leadership Institute and so much more with the network. All right. Well, thank you, Tristana. Um, trying to make myself the spotlighted presenter, but not figuring that out. So you're going to have to go without my face for right now. But <clears throat> over the uh, beginning of this year, we switched our school garden support organization leadership institute to no, not surprise to you and me, a virtual one. And we had lots of different talks, um, uh, topics that we covered from equity to um, evaluation, which we're going to talk about today. Um, we also <clears throat> discussed creating strong lessons. Um, and all of these uh, best practices, we created webinars. Next slide deck, Tristana, or next slide, Tristana. And so here's an example of the uh, webinars, and they're all archived on our website. And for each webinar, we've also created uh, an immense amount of resources related to the topics and updated our promising practices pages. So we rebranded our best practice pages to our promising practices pages. If you go to our promising practice page, you can see the topic area on assessment, program evaluation, sharing our impacts. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But also know these other topics, um, lessons, equity, and sustaining school gardens you can find on our promising practices and webinars. We really want to share peer to peer, and that's what we're here to do today. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll introduce um, our agenda topics. Um, so we're finishing up our introduction and what we're going to do is talk really broad brush about assessing creating effective questions and sharing impacts and along the way we're going to have time for q a so we know we're presenting a lot of content um, know that our website has an immense amount of resources shared from sgso organizations to support you and if you go deep on our web page um, next slide um, at sgsonetwork.org slash evaluation, you'll find links to the categories we're discussing today. Um, that same page on sgsonetwork.org slash evaluation has loads more resources to the topics of evaluation. And there are things that we will not be discussing that you will find on that page. Like for example, we're not talking about creating theories and change and logic models. And we know that's a really important element of doing this work um, of making change in students' lives. But we have an incredible amount of resources on this evaluation page and we link to about 30 other organizations that are similar to yours, other school garden support orgs, and images and descriptions of their logic models. So I wanna let you know that there's loads more resources than what we're talking about on this evaluation page. And from this evaluation page, you can click to the topics that we're gonna be discussing today. So with no further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to our first team, Katie Donahue, Leah Hillman, Heather Plonsky, and Grace. And they're gonna be talking about aligning tools with desired outcomes and sharing loads of examples of surveys and survey tools. Hello everyone, I am Katie Donahue at the Growing Minds Educational Farm near Charleston, South Carolina. I work with uh, local school gardens, grades K through 12, and then we also offer educational programming here at the farm. Not so much during COVID, but we are finally getting back uh, into that literally this week. So super excited about that. 
and I am going to uh, tell you a little bit about what our group was tasked with, and then the group members are going to give you some more details and show you our website. But I was the leader of group two, and we were given um, just a ton of previous SGSO uh, Institute resources that were kind of just in all these Google Drive folders. Um, so we have taken those and organized them in a way to make them more digestible and easier to navigate. Um, and that has turned out to be the website that Leah is going to show you in just a moment. And I think we can go ahead and change the slide and click onto our website. And I'm going to pass it over to you, Leah. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm Leah Hillman. I'm the education program manager at Jones Valley Teaching Farm in the wonderful Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and as Katie said, what we were really digging into was looking through all of these wonderful um, evaluations and assessments that had already been shared with the SGSO network in the past um, and trying to break them up into a way um, that was a little bit easier uh, to really dig into them if you were looking for examples. Um, and so Tristana, you can um, scroll down just a little bit into that first vegetable consumption. Thanks. Um, so there was also a chart that we were kind of um, trying to assess on our own that had broken up assessments into these six uh, different outcome categories. Um, and so we kept that as our framework. If you were looking to build out assessments, these six areas might be a good place to start. Um, so vegetable consumption was our first one. Student engagement. Um, and Tristana, you can scroll down a little bit as we go. Um, community engagement was next. And then teacher engagement garden productivity and socio emotional or social emotional well being and so those were kind of our big umbrella um, outcome categories and then, as you see as we were scrolling in each of those there are different um, indicators, and so what we did is we kept the indicators that had you know been worked on through these past institutes but we looked through all of the Google Drive folders and we found examples of. Um, survey existing surveys that would then link to these indicators so you'll see the one that's um, being pulled up right so here's a sage garden project survey um, that is an example for the indicator in vegetable consumption i believe for the number of new vegetables introduced tasted or cooked um, and there are multiple surveys for that one neophobia had multiple surveys vegetable consumption um, was one that we found a lot of examples for but then as um, tristana is clicking on it now there were definitely indicators that we didn't have any examples for um, and so our website is kind of like a living document living website People, you know, all over have um, examples. So if you feel like you have something that you can share, um, there is a link where you can do so, um, which Tristana is having covering over. Um, very easy Google form. Um, and you can add it to the list. Um, if you can scroll down to the bottom, Tristana of the website. There's also where it says survey question resources. Um, we found we kind of sifted through all of these and tried to pull some different survey questions from each. So if you'll go ahead and click on that document, we created kind of like a survey bank, um, survey question bank for some of those indicators um, that we had already linked on the website. So if you'll scroll to that first one in vegetable consumption, instead of having to go through the whole survey, now you can find one easy example um, of what it would mean to, you know, ask about changes in preferences or add it towards, towards fruits and vegetables. Um, and so it just kind of, so you don't have to scroll through a whole survey to find it. Um, but then we've also linked the surveys that these have been taken from so that if you do want more examples, they are provided as well. And I'm going to um, pass it off to my group members.
All right, next, uh, we're going to start with Grace, and she is going to answer uh, one of the questions that we received in your pre-registration documents. So uh, one of the questions that was posed was adapting or working from school district assessment and evaluation. What's possible and where do you start? I think Heather actually was able to answer that question. All right, yeah. over to Heather then. Heather, if you'll just introduce yourself real quick and answer yeah. that for us. Sure. Um, my name is Heather Polanski. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work at Food Corps. Um, I'm based out of their Portland office, but we're a national organization that does school gardening, healthy school meals, and nutrition education in a variety of schools across the country. Um, so again, I'm going to repeat the question. Um, it was adapting or working from school districts assessment and evaluation, what's possible and where to start. Um, so I think it's a really great idea to try to tack on questions or exist or um, evaluation materials and tools to an existing evaluation and assessment to like reduce survey overload and burden for teachers, um, principals, other people at the school and various stakeholders. Um, to make that happen, you'll definitely need to have like a good relationship with your district leaders and need to figure out how feasible it is to add on additional questions, tools and measures to whatever their existing evaluation materials are. Um, this is really going to vary from like state to state and district to district because some of these assessments and tools may be tied to like state requirements or district requirements. So it's really important to set up meetings with the relevant people early. And I could see that being someone like the nutrition services director at the district, the superintendent, if there's a wellness leader at the district, it really will depend at the district who the best point of contact is. Um, but you can work with them to figure out how to get some of your tools and assessments included in their existing assessment and evaluation tools. Um, the same kind of rationale also applies to if you want to tack on things to a school level evaluation or assessment that a school is doing, I would suggest working with the principal or wellness leader at the school to figure out what makes sense from that perspective. Um, so I don't know if the person who asked that question is on the call right now and like if that it's kind of what you were looking for. If we misinterpreted the question, I'm happy to like help out with that. All right, so if you ask that question and you have additional questions, you know, based on that answer, just throw it in the chat and um, we can address it um, a little bit further in the presentation. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and throw out another question that we received in the pre-registration and Heather, and Grace, you guys can just hop on and, and let me know which one of you has the answer to this. Um, are there examples of measurement tools for ELL and SPED students? Katie, I can um, answer this or help answer it. I'm Grace, I'm from the Sage Garden Project based in San Diego and I'm our training and evaluation manager. And at Sage, we fund educators to teach garden and nutrition education at elementary schools across um, uh, California. And so I do believe that some of our example surveys measure program impact for English language acquisition and accessibility of learning to special education students from the perspective of a classroom teacher whose students have experienced learning in the garden. And I believe it's the City Sprouts survey from 2015, 2016, which asks classroom teachers about both of these outcomes and you can find it on our little website. Awesome, thanks Grace. All right, next question was, what is the best way to get classroom teachers to respond to surveys um, as, as well as involving families in surveys? I could start answering this question as well and then anyone else feel free to chime in. So with Sage Garden Project, we introduce evaluation expectations to our schools at the very beginning of our relationship with them. We've actually added it to our MOUs with admin so that they understand that this is part of our support, but not all organizations function that way. And that also may not align with how they conduct evaluations, but regardless, I think having support from admin like a principal who is encouraging and requesting classroom teachers to respond to the survey will hopefully increase that response rate. Um, we've also had some educators who are looking to involve parents and families um, offer like raffles. Um, and so they send out the email with the survey and anybody who participate or who participates is entered into a small raffle to receive like garden supplies or cooking supplies or seeds or something small. Um, so that has been somewhat successful with including parents and families, but I think in general, trying to decrease participant 
burden by making the survey short and concise is also helpful. I know later we'll go over best practices for survey questions, but like a short survey, I think less than 10 minutes that is accessible online in multiple forms um, in multiple languages will increase participation. Awesome, thank you. Heather, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I didn't have anything to add to that, but I did see in the um, chat box, someone asked a follow-up question to the question I had answered and I was about to put in the chat box and I'll say it out loud and then also, um, I don't have any templates offhand for like a school district level assessment, but Food Corps uses something called the Healthy School Progress Report for school level assessments of like the school-wide culture of health and just health and nutrition and school gardening environment in general, which could be like a good jumping off point that you'd have to adapt to make sense for a district, but I'm gonna share that in the chat box. It's also part of the website. We had shared it in um, one of the categories. I don't remember which one off the top of my head, but I will share it in the chat box if people want easy access to that right now. Wonderful, thank you, Heather. All right, I have a couple more questions that we um, received in the pre-registration and then, you know, if any more pop up in the chat, we can address those as they come up. Um, next question for uh, my group two members, measuring skills and behavioral change through non-surveys, do, do we have tools for that? I can go ahead and start on this one too. The majority of the tools that we sifted through were surveys. Um, and so technically you can measure skills or behavior change in a survey. I'm thinking of like a pre and post fruit and vegetable consumption survey. However, like definitely understand that non-survey based tools can be a really powerful, powerful form of measuring change. But for a small nonprofit or a team at a school, it can be really overwhelming to measure and analyze these types of outcomes. Um, that being said, I have seen some programs in partnership with universities conducting research, measure behaviors like fruit and vegetable consumption and food waste via like complex ob observations at lunch, pre and post intervention. So think like, okay, we're gonna take a picture of each child's lunch before they eat and after they eat. And then we have to code for each child and put the sticker on the tray and make sure that that aligns. So I don't know how feasible it is for the average organization to conduct these types of analyses. However, if you have any resources related to these outcomes using tools other than a survey, I mean, by all means, add them to the outcomes framework page of the website um, that Tristana showed you, that little Google form that you can get to super easy. But yeah, anybody else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would just add like kind of similar to what Grace was saying. It really is, it's, well, it's partially also depending on like what behavior you're trying to measure. Like sometimes you could just get it from like simple observations. And if it's like just counting how many students eat certain foods, like it's time intensive, but not as intensive. Like if you're doing a plate waste study that takes a lot of like human power and time. So it might be difficult for small nonprofits like partnering with a research institution might be a good way of going about that. Um, but yeah, depending on other observations, if you don't wanna do a survey, you could, like maybe have a focus group or like interview teachers to like have them tell you through qualitative data if they're seeing any changes. It really just depends on like what you're trying to measure and how um, like intense you need the data to be, if that makes sense. Wonderful, thanks guys. Um, that's gonna wrap up the time for group two, but um, I wanna thank the group members for all the work they did on this project. And thank you, uh, Grace and Heather for answering the questions and Leah for giving us an introduction to the website. And I hope that everyone finds these resources um, easy to find, navigate. And next we're gonna tell you uh, all about if you want to create your own survey rather than going into a survey question bank and, and getting ones that are already out there, um, just about how you can design your own wonderful survey questions. So I am going to pass things off to the next group. Thank you, team. I'm uh, spotlighting the next folks, um, Scott, mm -hmm. Jamila, and Luisa. And we are gonna talk about creating those great questions and cultural responsive evaluations. Remi wanna remind folks that there are some great questions in the chat. And if you have anything to add to the discussion, we weren't able to get to every single question on the last topic. 
um, please answer if you have um, ideas of what people are asking in the chat. So Scott, Louisa, and Jamila, take it away. We need to unmute you guys. Let's see. And Jamila and Louisa, we're, I see we're getting unmuted. Yes. Brilliant. Yes, we are right. <laughs> Okay, welcome and um, thank you for your participation in the chat and for the questions that you sent ahead of time. My name is Luisa Aviles and I'm one of the instructional coach at Outteach based in the Washington DC area. And out in Outteach, we empower teachers to unlock student performance with the power of experiential learning outdoors. Our team look at the key characteristics of great service, sample survey questions, including culturally responsive evaluation. One suggestion that we can give you today is that you can take the sample surveys that the group two presented and apply these best practices that we are going to share. And if you can go to the next slide, uh, Tristana, mm -hmm. the next one, thank you. Okay, so our website was built as a guide to show the main points chaired by Dr. Mele Witton from Stanford University during the 2020 School Garden Support Organization Leadership Institute. Dr. Witton presented key characteristics of creating surveys and she referenced service examples from attending organizations. And this website, or this website was meant to outline important elements of her presentation. You are going to find YouTube links for short clips from that presentation. Next slide, please. This website is divided in 14 subtopics and they are listed here, including sections where participants ask a specific input from Dr. Witten. For example, number seven is a Q&A related to reliability and validity for scale responses. And number 10 is a Q&A related to including balanced responses. For each of these subtopics, you are going to find descriptions, examples, and a YouTube video. Today, I'm going to go deeper into section five and 11, since these two areas seem to be the most popular. Next slide, please. Okay, the first one is question types to avoid. In this clip, Dr. Wheaton explained why to avoid agree, disagree scale questions in your surveys. She also talks about the tendency for respondents to agree with statements. In essence, is they don't want to get on your bad side or they want to follow what appear to be social norms. So for example, if I ask you this question, do you agree that it's better to give than to receive? In a social context, the answer is yes. So uh, to avoid this bias by asking clear questions that address specific situations. For example, Instead of asking about the program in general, ask about how knowledgeable the educators were or whether the teacher issue was resolved or the readiness of the volunteer to help. Also make it clear what the purpose of the survey is. If you want to improve service, let your respondents know that honest answers are the most helpful to you and to them. Next slide. The next one is begin scale with more negative response choice. In this clip, Dr. Witton explained that people are more likely to be agreeable and choose their first response, especially if it's positive, which can skew the data. So it is important to provide enough options so your respondents can give an accurate answer. At the same time, you don't want to provide so many answers that the degree of difference between each one is too small. While you could add a neutral response for people that would prefer not to answer, it is best to use an even number of responses for people and skip the neutral option. Like John mentioned before, we have lots of information on the webpage and probably we will conduct more in-depth webinars in the future related to measuring and sharing impact. Thank you for your attention and I'm going to pass it to Jamila. 
All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jamila Moore. I'm the Education Director um, for Grow Portland here in Portland, Oregon. And uh, it was such a pleasure to be a part of this Leadership Institute. And uh, my role was really looking at um, Dr. Melly Wheaton's 2021 presentation, which was focused on culturally responsive evaluation, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And I think our whole team really learned a lot from. Um, kind of piggybacking on what Luisa was just talking about, this presentation from Mele was really more of an approach to evaluation rather than a template. And that's because CRE is a newer evolving framework for evaluation and really important that it is customized to each community or school that you're working with. So it takes a little bit more time and I'll talk about some of those considerations as we go through this. Um, but you can really get through a lot of kind of deeper understanding of what the community is looking for. Um, so some of the characteristics in CRE is that it's really focused on community empowerment, social justice, and the relationships within um, schools and the communities. It centers the participants' experiences and perspectives, and it also prioritizes um, whoever is participating in it in terms of how you design the evaluation. Um, there's a lot of attention that needs to be paid towards the power dynamics between the participants and the evaluators. So that might be looking at the power dynamics between class and status, uh, languages spoken, also ages. So if you're working with children, understanding the power between adults and children and the dynamics within that. And then all of the tools that you're choosing to use, um, really thinking about whether they're culturally appropriate or culturally relevant. Surveys are great. They, you can get a lot of really important quick information. They're also one of the least culturally responsive evaluation tools. So it's really important when you're designing your evaluation that you're thinking through um, what your objectives are and who you're trying to report to. If it's about a funder report, a survey might be a really great way to get the information you're looking for. If you're really trying to build relationships and focus on social justice, surveys probably aren't gonna be the way that you wanna go. Um, CRE is really looking at the subjectivity, so not trying to do that false objective stance between an evaluator and participants, but acknowledging that everyone brings their own perspectives and worldviews, and that's an important part of this. And then really in the um, way that you're disseminating results, storytelling is an important element of this, and that can look a lot of different ways, but that's a big piece. Um, another thing that I didn't think about that I learned from Mele is when you're looking at the results, you're not only looking at the majority. So if you get 70% of teachers that all respond one way, often that's the way that we would present um, the majority of results. But the 30% that were maybe outliers in CRE, you're paying equal attention to those outliers and really making sure that those voices are also heard. And then at the end of all of this, it's really important that you share those results back with the community and make sure that they've reviewed and signed off on them. All right, next slide, please. Um, so understanding who your audience is, these are just a couple questions that Melly suggested. If you potentially want to get some evaluation with teachers, you might do a pre and post um, conversation and maybe you're not looking, um, you're just doing a more open-ended conversation. So what connections do you want these students to make? And maybe you're looking beyond the classroom. Maybe you're also thinking about what they might be connecting to their families, their community. And then at the end, coming back and seeing, using the same um, techniques that Luisa explained, really connecting back to what the question was. So what are the connections that you want them to make? And then coming back at the end and what connections did students make? And then also making space for maybe asking a question about what some of the barriers or challenges might be that teachers might be expecting or anticipating as they start the program and then acknowledging those at the end as well. So not only looking for affirmation and the success of a program. All right, next slide. Um, we were asking for examples of CRE, and there's not a lot out there in terms of what's publicly available. So I was given permission to share a little bit about my master's thesis, um, which I did up in Vancouver, BC in Canada. And I did um, a year I spent with fourth and fifth grade classroom. I spent 
a whole day every week for a year. And these families were mostly from um, Southeast Asian immigrant families. And I was really looking to do a qualitative documentation of their experiences in the school garden. And the first day I came in and I introduced myself and told them what I was doing. And a fourth grader um, raised his hand and said, oh, so you're just using us to get your degree. That's basically what you're doing. Like, what is this actually for? And that was a really um, big turning point for me because yes, I was using them to get my master's degree. And I had to really look at what were their voices and um, how I was gonna help uh, highlight where they were coming from. So what I really dove into is redoing my whole evaluation design and having the students become co-researchers. So they chose their own pseudonyms, they helped to write all of the interview questions, and then chose the different research methods that they wanted to use. So it wasn't about all of them having consistent choices throughout. They got to choose whether they wanted to do a lot of photography or interviews or art, and then we were um, reviewing all of those in terms of making sense of the data. All right, next slide. Um, so in the end, my thesis was 300 pages and included a lot of their photos and journal writings. And we got a really kind of in-depth understanding of where they were coming from and um, what they were learning out in the garden. I learned a lot. So there was a lot of reciprocal learning in this. Um, I ended up going to their Asian grocery stores and buying the produce that they were suggesting after I realized that they didn't want to eat the beets and radishes that I was suggesting that were coming from my culture. So I was really learning about a lot about their cultures. And in the end, there was a lot of really nuanced learning that came from this. Um, now, this took a lot of time. Um, I think Grace was mentioning earlier that this is not always replicable for small nonprofits. And you really have to think about who you're trying to do this research for. But I do think it's possible that you can use elements of this in your, in your evaluation approach. All right, next slide. Um, so like I said before, surveys are one of the least culturally responsive ways to evaluate. And so there are other ways that you can do this at Grow Portland. Um, this was a question in the chat earlier. One thing that we do with our kinder first graders and often with our ELL students or newer readers is we might have a list of questions and we make it into a game at the end of the year. So we might say something like line up all the kids and um, for everyone who loves tasting kale or who tried a new vegetable, flap your wings and jump to the finish line. And then the teacher will count how many kids chose to use their bodies and respond in a kinetic way. Um, so it's fun and it's exciting. And we also tell them there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. So we're trying to make sure that they feel comfortable in responding however they want to. We also use a lot of open-ended questions and a lot of drawings. So these are just some examples of the ways that we um, collect this data. Now I will say it requires a lot of synthesis and coding and the ways that you need to make sense of this at the end. Um, but I think it's something that we can all at least strive towards. So that's it for me. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Scott Bell. I work at OutTeach uh, with Louisa. And I'm here to ask our uh, uh, panelists here a couple of questions. And so one panelist that's come through is for you, Jamila. And it is about the trade-offs between doing the research that you did in a culturally relevant participatory way versus doing it in another maybe more traditional way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot about um, being comfortable surrendering a certain amount of control and having a lot of intention and clarity around what your objective is. So um, I think a lot of us just kind of operate in autopilot and go through the same way that we might do every evaluation. And the trade-off or the consideration might just be really pausing and really clarifying what that is. Thank you. And Louisa, we have a question for you as well mm -hmm. on... One of your slides, you shared um, response choices, and mm -hmm. in particular, starting with a negative response choice first. In, in that particular question, the choices were around how helpful uh, an aspect of the programming was. Do you have other ideas for the types of response choices that people might ask their program participants about? Yes, thanks, Scott, for, for that question. And there are some examples that I would like to share. Uh, the first one is likelihood. So likelihood scale questions and responses are usually used to determine whether 
your customers will adopt a particular behavior, uh, such to continue to buy a certain product or recommend your program to others. So for that example, you may use the language very unlikely, unlikely, likely, very likely. Also, you maybe um, you could consider satisfaction. So satisfaction scale questions and responses are best used when you want to get a very subjective opinion from your teachers or principals. They are usually asked in regard to your organization, products, or services. So for satisfaction, you may use the language very satisfied, dissatisfied, satisfied, very satisfied. And last but not least is importance. Important scale questions and responses seek to gain a deeper understanding about why people feel the way they do. So for this example, you may use not at all important, low importance, very important or extremely important. Thank you. Thank you both for your, your work on this and for your presentations. And uh, I think it's a time of presentation where we kick it over to John to introduce our next group. Awesome. Thank you, team. Um, I'm sure we're filling your heads with loads of information. Um, know that the website's there to uh, find your examples to um, relate to the work that you need to be doing and find examples that are specific to your work. We're going to close out here by sharing how SGSOs share their impact. And this was a team I was a part of with Amelia and Beth. And I was just blown away uh, working with these two women and realizing there are so many more ways to share our impact than I could have thought of. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to them and we're going to learn about that. So Amelia and Beth, take it away. Hi. Uh, my name is Amelia Bird. I'm the program manager for Edible Schoolyard New Orleans. Our organization, ESY NOLA, teaches children healthy connections through food in the natural world and classes and events at four school gardens and two teaching kitchens at First Line Schools in New Orleans. Um, and that's me. And we can go to the next slide. Next, thank you. Uh, as I know that we all know because we are here and we care about evaluation, program evaluation is so valuable for making program adjustments to make sure our work has the deep lasting outcomes that we intend for our children and families, for our educators, for our communities and for the environment. Um, but what we, what we really wanted to focus on, on was how taking the time to plan communication so that you can share your findings um, in strategic ways with your stakeholders helps you build the case for funding, both new and sustained. It helps you get buy-in. It helps you invite newcomers to be engaged in your work. And so the promising practices that Beth and I are going to share from a variety of school garden support organizations show that you can build impact reporting into every way that you are already communicating. The keys are to include data whenever you can and to remember that stories are data. Next slide. So here are some of the ways that we can share impact. We're really curious to see where everybody lands with this. Um, so if you we've got a poll that just popped up, please tick all of the ways that you use, all the different tactics that you use specifically to share evaluation results and program impacts. And we will share the results. And Tristana, as soon as they the results start coming in, you can change the screen so you can so everyone can see results. Great. It looks like about a little over half have submitted, and I will go ahead and share right now. Thank you. All right. So strongest in the internal sharing category. Um, also very high on verbal sharing, which is awesome. I'm glad people are thinking of that. Blogs are a little underutilized as are press releases. Um, and yeah, kind of even on the different newsletters, um, verbal sharing slide decks and presentations in like a one pager is another thing that we're gonna kind of focus on a little bit. 
Thank you so much. And we can move on to the next slide. So here are our promising practices. Next slide. I am going to drop this into the chat real quick so that you can see it is a very large um, flow chart. <laughs> this is um, our first promising practices is to plan communications by your audience. So defining your audiences, where they get their media and information, what objectives they might have with your organization, all that helps you identify how to best reach them and with what information. Um, I'm sharing our um, my organization's data blueprint. It's the, on the top of the screen. It's kind of the who gathers the data, what methods we're using, where we store that data, and then how it flows through our communication methods to reach each of our audiences. So if you click the link in the chat, you can see it in detail. But I've included a close up of our audiences at the bottom. It's quite a flow chart, but it's been a really helpful planning tool for us and making sure that everybody is getting reached um, and we know where all of that data is being stored so that we can reach them. Next slide. I wanted to share another project management tool that we've used. Um, it's our kind of communications plan for our evaluation. I'm showing you an excerpt of our audience matrix. Uh, where I've outlined what kinds of data we give to each of our audience, at what frequency, and how we think they're going to use it. You can find a template for this and other detailed planning tools for communication for your eval evaluation in a link. Um, and let me drop that into the chat as well. I'll give you just another second to digest some of this, but there are many other audiences that are possible and all of that is built into the template. And you can go to the next slide. Promising practice number two is to write clear, concise content. So we like to say that imagine that you're writing to a neighbor who might be curious about your work but doesn't really understand it. Um, try to make things accessible to a general audience. Avoid using jargon. Use subheadings to guide the eye and some kind of icon. And this is a strong example from Edible Schoolyard New York City, their impact one pager report. Uh, you can see that it's limited to a few colors, that it has kind of pull out graphics for the for the figures and that those the text is short and impactful. Um, it just helps people at different levels of your organization and different levels of familiarity with evaluation understand the data that they're seeing. And I'm going to turn it over to Beth for our next few promising practices around sharing impact. Hi there, I'm Beth Bacon. I'm with Fresh Farm Food Prints in Washington, DC. We embed food and garden education in uh, 15 partner schools <clears throat> with school gardens and, and teaching kitchens, um, integrating gardening and cooking um, into academic-based learning. Um, it's lots of joy digging in the dirt as all of you. Um, in your organizations. So I'll start with promising practice in number three. Um, so use and repurpose data when you're sharing impact. So <clears throat> qualitative and quantitative data, um, presenting those in different formats to reach different audiences. As Amelia said, there's lots of different audiences um, to communicate with and um, we want to reinforce that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You have great pieces of data. Um, here I have one piece of data from Foodprints that we have in a slideshow. Uh, we have it in our results webpage and we also have it on a, on a one pager. So um, finding the different places where you can repurpose the data for um, that particular audience and that particular format. We can go to the next slide. Number four is to use storytelling. So the storytelling really helps resonate um, with your audience's emotion and to make your data more relatable and memorable. Um, and the stories are sort of micro or macro levels. So a couple examples here. One, um, 
a great picture of a kid plus her quote tells the story of how much she's enjoying and what she's doing in the garden as an Instagram post. So um, social media is one of the types of communications for your impact. And this is a way to just sort of make that con um, concise and uh, really hit that impact home. So this is want to point out that it's different than like a research report, right? So we're able to tell these stories in different ways. Life Lab has a moment of the month newsletter where they tell one story about a school they're working with or one, um, one story of an impact to really hone in on that. <clears throat> Next slide. Number five is to use visual elements. So really um, get away from really text heavy um, documents to call out numbers and uh, stats, let uh, use visual elements to help guide the eye to important pieces on the <clears throat> document. And um, Amelia <laughs> pointed out that this, this um, kid is making eye contact with you, right? So it's great photo here. Um, really talking to the reader and only two photos. So you can kind of hone in on the stories that those two photos are telling you. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. Our last promising practice is a, a bit more nuanced. <laughs> so we don't um, uh, wanna say that we know everything about this, but we wanted to give a nod to practicing culturally relevant communications using asset-based language and seeking input and review from diverse voices and perspectives. Um, there's a couple of um, resources that we have here that I'll put in the chat after, um, really honing in on this piece around communication um, that is culturally relevant. This storytelling graphic um, is one that really caught our eye as we reviewed maybe 50 resources for this webpage. Um, it tells a lot of stories. It, it, it's different than any other um, piece that we looked at. Um, and it really felt culturally relevant and appropriate to us. So I wanted to share that. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Amelia and Beth. And we're going to um, transition into answer a couple questions related to sharing impact. Um, the first one was um, kind of something that was eye-opening to me, and it was related to how organizations do internal sharing of their data. Um, and I would love to hear some examples from Amelia and Beth about how organizations, and, and this is probably most more relevant for larger organizations, but how do you share your impacts among your staff and your, 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 your collaborators that are close to your staff and or your board? <clears throat> I can start and Beth, maybe you can add on a couple of things that we do. We have an internal newsletter. It has a couple of really great purposes. Um, it goes out every Friday. All of our educator staff contribute to it. And so it's automatically generating content each week that we then use for social media that's coming directly from our educators. And it's a way to keep a multi-site staff connected with each other, have shout outs, have shared resources, that sort of thing. But we also have a data section. So we're trying to report out on the evaluation results as they come out with our staff in an internal form. Another really fun thing I've heard from Whittable Schoolyard New York um, from Jesse Tartanian, hey Jesse, is a data party that they throw with their staff where they, she's even put like statistics on little pieces of paper inside a pinata uh, to <laughs> try to make it joyful and like make some time for small groups to discuss what's the impact of the results that we're seeing from these different measures. So those are, those are just some fun ways that I know of. Beth, do you want to add? Uh, just a simple one. We have an internal staff newsletter um, for our entire organization. So the Foodprints program is part of a larger organization and we try to just sort of um, regularly get some information about impact into there. Not a big splash about research results, but just again, um, hitting home in many different um, opportunities with different audiences. <clears throat> Amelia, you're, you're, you kind of reminded me of a way that we collect data and share it um, at the end of all of our field trips. We have a field trip program. We ask our staff or our, uh, our field trip guides, our student interns to share any great quotes of, of, from kids. And we just write them right down there during our field trip. 
and then those could be you know reshared through various uh, forms but then we would also share those at our staff meeting to kind of bring the feel of what happens out in our field trips to the folks that aren't out there every day so that was just a really good reminder of that um, one last question before we're going to open questions to everybody else um, what are some examples of um, <clears throat> like verbal, uh, some more examples of verbal sharing. And I've seen things written down like, you know, phone calls and tours and field trips. Um, and I'm wondering if you can add to that list of, of how can we strengthen our verbal sharing? And I'll just cue us off that I know at our organization during our strategic planning, we practice our elevator pitch. So we practice how do we share what we do to strangers? So um, do you guys want to add to some tips for um, doing verbal sharing of impact? One thing that we've done is um, try to talk about our impact in different areas. So academic enrichment, health, um, environmental responsibility, and social emotional learning, and give an example for each. And so um, that helps more general audiences and people that we're talking to connect with at least one of those, right? And see um, impact in an area that they know about and care about. <clears throat> this is kind of just saying what you said in a different way, John, but we have goals to train spokespeople at different levels of our organization who are having lots of touch points with volunteers or maybe like one person at every school who has like a few data points just like in their in their toolkit that they can easily pull out if they're speaking with a funder who dropped by or the press or something like that so but in addition to that school leaders folks who may not be direct program staff but who have touch points with the work and uh, need to be able to report out so that's something that we are aiming to do in the next year great well, thank you. So at this time, I'm going to bring back all our panelists onto the screen and uh, we're going to address some of the questions that were put in the chat um, and or some of the questions that were posed during our registration. And the first question came from Sally Marston, um, about, uh, who's at the University of Arizona, their community and school garden program. And they've begun planning uh, a program evaluation and they're interested in doing more participatory um, evaluation, like bringing in stakeholders, teachers, principals, families, you know, that might be focus group discussions. Um, do any of our panelists have a, um, examples of doing this more participatory evaluation um, that they could sp speak to how they've done that? And I know this is a bigger undertaking um, than, than just, you know, throwing out the survey to folks. So um, it's like taking evaluation to the next level, but I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight everybody that's on our panel, and if any of our panelists want to jump in and answer of examples of how you've done participatory <coughs> evaluation, that'd be great. I'll speak quickly. Um, we have. Uh, try to build evaluation or assessment into existing conversations with teachers and with parents. So we had a summer program where the teachers would meet weekly and our evaluator would sit in on that meeting and we tried to get to certain um, points in the meeting that was helpful to her, but that was less of a burden on the, the teachers um, to do things in the virtual classes since everything was upended last summer and the teachers were also calling parents as part of this program and so we had them ask um, certain questions that fed into our evaluation so use that <clears throat> avenue um i have a couple of instances to share so when we partnered with a third party evaluator when we first started doing evaluation years ago one of the, the one of the very first things that we did was develop a logic model as a staff and then our evaluator helped us to present that to key stakeholders in our community who were receiving services from us or helping us to deliver services and so our uh, community that we work with got to weigh in on the outcomes and impacts and and activities that we were pursuing to be able to just kind of give like 
content validity to that to say, yeah, that looks good. That's the stuff that's meaningful to us as well. And so that was a way to engage external stakeholders and participants in a more participatory way. Um, and, and then currently we have, um, we are piloting a, an observation rubric for when we do one-on-one -on -one job embedded coaching with teachers. And we are going to go through a similar process with that rubric with the external stakeholders. Um, we've done a little bit informally, but we'll be going through a more formal process to do that with some support from a third party as well, where we say, okay, so here's this rubric and these practices and these indicators on a scale for these practices. And are these the right practices that are meaningful to you in your work and do you, and the things that OutTeach can support you with? So those are two examples from OutTeach about how we've pursued some participatory uh, research. Um, I'll just add another way um, to help with some participatory research is also just like sharing back your results and providing opportunity for the people involved to provide impact on it. So even if you're not able to involve them in the whole process, because that can be kind of labor intensive and also like requires a lot of work on their end, if like you share back the results with the teachers or the school stakeholders or like community members before you like officially publish them or do anything with them to make sure everything is like aligned with what they were saying. We've done that a few times and that's been super helpful just as like a kind of like a check on you to make sure you didn't like make stuff up based on what you were hearing. Great. If um, no one else has anything to share on the topic of participatory design, I'm going to throw out another question that was posed during our registration. Uh, some folks asked about working from a school district's assessment or evaluation. So how can you, um, I'm assuming this means like getting into an assessment or an evaluation that's already happening. Um, or can you pull data from a school district or can you influence an assessment that's already being done across your district? So how can you embed what your goals of assessment would be and partner that with what your school district's already doing? Any examples? I guess I could start with one. Um, we, at the, in the district that we work with in Paro Valley Unified School District, we have been speaking more closely with, you know, the administrators of the district and their grant writers and such. And one area that we're wanting to look at is um, attendance data. Um, and that's data that they have uh, easily, uh, you know, easy to access and uh, access. And then we can compare that with the sites that we're bringing guard ed educations to their school sites. We don't know if um, garden-based learning um, impacts attendance or not, but it is one question that we wanna look at. We have seen that um, referenced in other research reports that school gardens increase you know, a love of learning and eagerness to attend schools. So that's one data point we know the school district has, and we compare that with our days of instruction um, that we know kids are going out to the garden. John, that's um, really similar to what we're looking into gathering here at Sage Garden Project. So um, yeah, working with districts and comparing attendance data for different programming. I know that attendance is an indicator that people in power are really, really interested in at the state level. So um, starting with those outcomes that will really speak to those who are in a position to sustain school garden programming is a great way to start. And so. Um, yeah, we're trying to do something similar. Great. Well, I'll use this um, silence to practice a bit of collecting data and information from participants. And I put in the chat a link to our post webinar survey. So at the end, we're going to continue with questions, but I just want to make sure that you have the link to our post webinar survey. Uh, we use this to improve our webinars. Um, so that's just my plug to let you know to do that. We'll send you this as well in the follow-up email and when this uh, 
webinar ends. But I'm gonna to transition to another question. This is a really popular question I've heard a lot. How do you get teachers to answer surveys? And I know we might've touched on that earlier today, but with our whole panelists, um, what are ways that you can actually get your teachers, um, classroom teachers to respond to surveys? They're like so, so busy. And how can we involve parents and families in our surveys? So that I'm asking two different questions in one, which is not a good way to ask questions, but that gives you more ways to answer. I'll start by saying in our program, we actually started bringing tablets and paper surveys out to our garden. Our instructors would bring it out and hand it to the teacher when the kids came out to the class and say, hey, can you take some time while this class is happening and fill out this survey? You can either do it on the tablet right here or you can do it on this piece of paper. And so that the, um, the, the educator, the teacher could do that while the class was happening. I've also heard of garden programs to put QR codes on their gardens because they know their teachers are coming out with their phones and the teachers can scan the QR code and then boom, there's the survey for the teacher to answer on their phone. So any other ideas on um, encouraging teachers and or parent family involvement in the surveys that you're sending out? Um, I mean, I think another idea, if you have the ability is to provide some sort of incentive, like we all respond well to incentives, um, either if like you're able to give something small to everyone who does it, but that's like kind of pricey and hard. You can do some sort of like raffle that like you'll be entered into a raffle to win a blotty blot. And I don't know, people get excited about raffles. I get excited about raffles. So that's one way to, I think that could work on both teachers and community members as some sort of incentive to make it happen. We also really utilize our relationships with principals. So we have 10 schools at Grow Portland. And when we want to survey teachers, we found it's really valuable to send the survey link directly to the principal. And then the principal actually allocates time during a staff meeting. So we have to make the survey super short, very concise and to the point. Um, and then the principals that are advocating for this, it really, I mean, we've had a huge response rate happen through that. All right, what about any involvement for parents and families? And that's like one step um, disassociated with your main audience for many of our SDSOs. We're working with students, um, but what are the ways to connect with, with parents or families to get um, kind of feedback or assessment data with them? I'll start by sharing that we do have um, built into our programming with our partners at the schools. There's like Saturday school and there's like uh, community information days. Um, where, where, you know, uh, our health fairs um, and those are elements and days that we can actually connect with parents and that would be a time when we could um, ask questions. It, it's less of handing out a, a physical survey, but it's more to kind of get the pulse of families um, and the impacts that we're making. It's a touch point where we can ask questions. Um, but do others have examples of how they connect with parents or families to get some of the impacts that maybe your programming is translating through their student into the parent or family? We do school newsletters um, that are also sent out through the principal or the secretary. And just this year, we started sending out very simple, just on Google form um, survey links in the newsletter. Um, and they were really around culturally specific foods that families wanted to grow in the gardens. So making sure that our gardens were um, growing food that those families wanted. We didn't get a huge response. And I think there were also some barriers around using technology that way, but it was a start. Just to add on, making sure that the surveys are accessible to all parents in a language and form that is responsive to, to them. Yeah, we have a secretary at one of our Spanish immersion schools who has been doing translations for us so that all of our surveys were in Spanish and English. And that was also a nice way to connect directly with one of the school um, staff people who is working as the translator. Well, um, I'm gonna use this opportunity to say thank you to all the panelists. This was our biggest group in our Virtual Leadership Institute. Um, and this is our last presentation of our promising practices. Um, we've shared an immense amount of information. You can find it on our promising practices page. Click over to the evaluation tab and find loads of information that we shared today. So a big gratitude shared to 
um, this whole team here that has showed up to share the work that they've done. Hopefully, you participants um, that attended our webinar today have learned a lot. You know where to go to our Promising Practices page. And last but not least, speaking of evaluation, there it is one more time for you to share your thoughts on how this presentation went. And we'll see you in the future. And hopefully you can come on out to our Growing School Gardens event, growingschoolgardens.org, and invite some of your classes and teachers to come on out and celebrate the power and purpose of school gardens. So thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, we'll see you at a future uh, event, whether that's a webinar or in person soon. Go vaccines. Goodbye.